Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Sermon for Sunday, June 15th, 2014. Today on Trinity Sunday, Pastor Bob Hiller brings us a message entitled, In the Name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, based on Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to 20. Let's listen in. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text today is going to be taken from the reading in the Gospel of Matthew, the text we famously have entitled The Great Commission. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son, Jesus, into this world to die for our sins, and by the power of the Holy Spirit have granted us faith to trust in him. Uh, we pray this day, Lord, that you would be with us, and we confess to you that there are times when we doubt your promises and we doubt your love. So give us conviction in the midst of our doubts and teach us to have faith by giving us your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Well, I am very excited because we are going to, in fact, confess the Athanasian Creed today. And this is like Christmas, theologically speaking, for me. I just love this thing. It's so long and complicated. And I stumble over the words, then you stumble over the words, then everyone's confused. Oh, it's just the way church should be. So it's a lot of fun. I get very excited to confess this thing. But there's something I always struggle with in this creed. And it's something that I imagine some of us here will struggle with this morning when we say it as well. And it's the very opening line. It starts off like this. Whoever desires to be saved must above all hold the Catholic faith. And don't worry about that word Catholic. It doesn't mean Roman Catholic. It means universal church, okay? So uh, that's why it says that. But whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled. Here's the part we struggle with. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will without a doubt perish eternally. Whoever does not keep what we are about to confess whole and undefiled will without doubt perish eternally. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Athanasian Creed Day. Yeah, that's, that's tough. Without a doubt, perish eternally. And now that, that troubles us, and it troubles us for two reasons. One, because we don't like to, to sound so narrow-minded all the time in our belief system, but the reality is that, it, that it's true, and we kind of have to, to deal with that. But the other reason it troubles us is this, is because we say to ourselves, well, wait a minute. Do I wholly confess this? Do I hold to this faith perfectly? Is my faith in what I'm about to confess completely undefiled? To be quite frank, I'm going to say the Athanasian Creed, and I'm not really sure I know what all the words even mean. What does it mean to worship God in Trinity and unity and unity and Trinity? What's the difference between being begotten and being made? What does it mean we worship one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they're not three gods but one God? This is, this is mind-boggling stuff, and you're telling me I have to believe this holy and undefiled, or else it's the fires of hell for me? I mean, what happens if, if pastor gets up, and I, this is where I get worried, what if I preach it wrong and I don't give you the right picture of the Trinity, and then you start believing the wrong picture of the Trinity, and before we leave, a massive flood comes and wipes us all out, what hope is there for us, right? Yo, without a doubt. I mean, this gets, this gets nerve-wracking. When this, this language of doubt and firm conviction arises, we get anxious because we're not so sure of our convictions we're not so sure about how firm our faith is, and we doubt ourselves. The reality is that for us with faith, doubt is something we wrestle with. Doubt is a struggle for all of us. But we live in a world right now that teaches us that that's a good thing, that doubt in and of itself is a virtue. Now, doubt can be beneficial to our faith. Because doubt brings questions, and when we have questions, we should pursue answers. The church fathers spoke about faith seeking understanding. This is, this is a good thing. When we don't understand something, when we have a question or a doubt, uh, when we're questioning everything, like Albert Einstein shows us to do on his chalkboard here today, the thing to do is not to just sit in the doubt, but to look for answers, to try and figure out the answers to our questions, to gain some conviction in our faith. The problem is right now we live in a world that says, no, 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 embrace the doubt. Doubt is a virtue that we should pursue. The only thing I think we're supposed to believe in in our world these days is ourselves, which is a terrifying thing if you're me. <laughs> uh, but we're to doubt everything. Doubt authority. Doubt the government. Doubt the church. Doubt the Bible. Doubt God. Doubt is a virtue in our culture. 
I'm gonna give you an example of this. I watched a TED video this last week. Have you ever seen those TED videos online? People who are coming up with new ideas or doing some influential things, they get a time to, to speak about what they're thinking. And the woman who I saw speak, her name was Leslie Hazelton. She is, the, she is a biographer of Muhammad. You know Muhammad, the, the guy who founded uh, Islam. She's the biographer of Muhammad, and she describes herself as an agnostic Jew. So an agnostic Jew who wrote a biography on Muhammad, which is a very strange life to lead, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but she came along saying, you know, she gave her speech on the topic of faith, doubt, and certainty. And this is, this is what she said. She said, Doubt is essential to faith. Not in the way we just spoke of, which says doubt raises questions, so you pursue answers. No, 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 no. Doubt itself is essential to faith. She says this, and that if faith doesn't have doubt, then it is nothing but heartless conviction. She said with a tremendous amount of ironic conviction. <laughs> it's the people with all the answers, she said, who are the violent fundamentalists. Throughout the history of the world, it's those with all the answers who have attacked the infidels. But it's those with the answers who are the true infidels, she said. And I wanted to ask her, are you certain about these things? <laughs> do you have some level of conviction with what you're saying? Because it certainly sounds like you do. Or should we be questioning you as well? Shouldn't we be doubting your doubts? And if we're doubting your doubts, are we certain that we should be doing that? And suddenly life just kind of starts to fall in on itself and we all go mad. We're doubting the doubts of the doubter and we're convinced that's the right thing to do or, or are we? It's just all very confusing. We are told to question everything and now we're told if you arrive at answers, you're wrong. There are no answers. Just embrace the doubt. Embrace the doubt. And this is a strange way of talking, to say something like doubt is essential for faith. Because we define faith as trust. Faith is a trusting in God, believing what he says. And God never comes along and says, I want you to doubt this thing. I don't want you to trust me. I don't want you to listen to what I have to say. I want you to question everything about me all the time. So that you have no convictions whatsoever. Doubt my love for you. Doubt my promises. Doubt the resurrection. Doubt the forgiveness of sins. God never says those words. God speaks to us in a word so that we do believe Him. So that we do trust in Him. Not so that we doubt. Now, to be sure... Again, this doesn't mean we're not going to have questions and we're not going to have doubts. But when we do, we should pursue answers. Doubts aren't necessarily sins, and they're also not necessarily good things. Doubts are just kind of reality. They're kind of neutral. It's what we do with those doubts that becomes very uh, important for us. And to say we should just embrace doubt is problematic. The author of the book, The Life of Pi, whose name I can't remember, he said this, and I thought this was a great quote. He says, choosing doubt as a philosophy of life is akin to choosing immobility as a means of transportation. That's pretty good. And choosing doubt as a philosophy of life, it's not going to take you anywhere. Healthy doubt leads to the pursuit of answers, but doubt is never an end unto itself. Further, if this really is a philosophy of life for us, think about how this plays itself out practically. I mean, it sounds really smart, intelligent to say, oh, oh faith is, or doubt is essential for faith. Uh, but what if, what if our relationships actually worked this way, right? Like, what if you could never trust your spouse? And so, like, so, for example, I'm doing my best friend's wedding in like three weeks, and I'm pretty fired up, and I'm very honored that he asked me to do it. I get to both stand up in the wedding, and then I get to preach. You know, so it's great. But I'm thinking to myself, I'm very honored to do this, but I'm thinking to myself, I've really got to do a good job, because as you yourselves all well know, I can be kind of boring. So I don't want to bore the guy. I want to give him a good sermon. So I'm thinking, what do I do? And I thought to myself, if I'm following this philosophy from Miss Hazelton, this is what my sermon's going to sound like. Now, if you guys want a good marriage, the bedrock of your marriage needs to be lack of trust. You need to doubt one another all the time. Question every single move. T text messages every 10 minutes, making sure you know exactly where one another are. Never, ever trust each other, because if you have no trust, then you have a firm and strong marriage. 
That would be bonkers, right? That would just be, that's just not right. Doubt and trust are not the same thing. They are opposites. And when we have doubts and when we have questions, the, the idea here is our faith causes us to pursue answers. Faith seeks understanding. It's a great line. Now, and I can tell you that all day. I can say, don't have doubts. Faith seeks understanding. And that's going to feel all well and good. And you'll say, okay, I'll go look for answers. But at the end of the day, the reality is we still do have doubts, don't we? We still struggle with questions. We don't have all the answers. By the way, heartless conviction comes from pretending you have all the answers when you really don't. Having the answers isn't heartless conviction. Knowing the truth of something doesn't make you heartless. It just means you know the truth. It's when you start pretending to know things you don't know that you've lost humility. We've confused doubt with humility, and that's, that's a big problem. But nonetheless, we have doubts. So what do we do with them? Well, as we think about this idea of doubt, we come to our reading today from Matthew's Gospel. And this is a phenomenal text. It's the Great Commission. And we all know the Great Commission. This is Jesus' missionary mandate for the church, where he sends the church out to preach the good news, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, teach everything he's commanded, and he promises to be with them always to the end of the age. It's a phenomenal passage. And we're so excited to get to this text and this teaching that sometimes we miss the context. We miss the very first thing Jesus does here and the very first thing the disciples do. In Matthew's Gospel, this is the first time the disciples encounter the resurrected Christ. It's kind of interesting. And when they encounter him, this is what the text says. They saw him and they worshipped him, but some doubted. Some doubted. If you come here this morning and you have doubts about Christ, if you have doubts about faith, if you have doubts about yourself, you're in the company of the apostles this morning. Because there, sitting in the presence of Christ, some doubted. Now, what did they doubt? Well, this is something we don't really actually have the exact answer to. We're not entirely sure, but we could guess a little bit. Perhaps they doubted that it was really Jesus. In a number of other sections, we read that those who encounter Christ don't immediately recognize him. So maybe they're not sure it's him. They're doubting it's actually Jesus. Maybe they're doubting Jesus is actually risen from the dead. Like we remember Thomas, right? Doubting Thomas. Thomas comes along and he says, I will not believe until I put my finger through the holes in his hands and in his side. And so maybe they were doubting in that way. They didn't believe until they, they got the physical touch. Maybe they're doubting that Jesus is going to be nice to them. Maybe they're doubting he's going to be gracious to them. Last time we saw the disciples in Matthew's Gospel, they were abandoning their friend. They were running away and hiding. And now here he's come, risen from the dead, having defeated sin, death, and the devil. And maybe they're worried, oh, we're next. He's come for us now. So maybe they're doubting his grace. It could be any number of things. We don't have the exact answer. But what I really want to focus on this morning is not why they're doubting, but how Jesus deals with the doubt. What does Jesus do with those who doubt? Perhaps even like you and me this morning, when we doubt, what does Jesus do with us? Now, there's two things he doesn't do. The first thing he doesn't do is what we heard from Miss Hazelton this morning. He doesn't teach them to embrace their doubt. He doesn't come to them and say, okay, now question all of this. It's like an X-Files episode, right? Question everything you see here. Am I really standing here in front of you? I don't know. It's kind of tricky. Now I'm going to fly up to heaven. See you later. Like, that's not what happens. He doesn't have them question him. He doesn't raise doubts, question the resurrection, question God, question my love for you. He doesn't do that. He doesn't tell them to embrace the doubt. He doesn't tell them, if you believe you're seeing me right now, and you tell other people about it, you're just full of heartless conviction. He doesn't do that. At the same time, he doesn't say, now you see me, so go out with heartless conviction. Go out and prove to the world how right you are. Go out and prove to the world how wrong they all are. Put yourself on a pedestal above them and be proud because I've shown myself to you and prove the rest of the world wrong. I'm your authority now. Submit, make everyone else suffer into submission. That's what you go do. Put them into submission. Be proud of yourselves because you're right and they're wrong. He doesn't say that either. That is heartless conviction. Jesus doesn't tell the disciples to be proud. Pride is not the answer to our doubts. And we have to be honest, because as the church, there are times when we have done this, where we've said, we're right and they're wrong. Therefore, I'm going to show them how wrong they are. They can see how right I am, and then maybe they'll come to Jesus. 
And so we try and do it by winning arguments. If we get more power, maybe we'll try and do it by uh, conquering nations. I mean, this is kind of stuff that has actually happened in the past. That's not what Jesus sent us out to do. That's not how you make disciples. So what do you do with doubts? And by the way, just as a side, it's very sad to me, and I ask for your prayers And this as a pastor and for all of us who, who teach in the church, it's always very sad to me to read the stories of people who have left the church because they were in youth group or they were in confirmation class and they had really hard questions. And the pastors or their teachers didn't know the answers and they made them feel dumb for even asking. And so they left the church because they couldn't get any serious answers. What happens there is the church is so convinced that they have to be convicted and they have to have all the right answers that when they don't, they say something like, well, just believe or else. Or else you're going to, you know, Athanasian Creed burn in the fires and all that stuff. You either get it or you don't. And they don't get any real answers. It was, was it Steve Jobs. He said that in his biography that he grew up in a, in a Lutheran church. Good news. Uh, and he had questions that he couldn't get answers to. No one would answer his questions. That's a sad thing. And sometimes there's a fear that if I don't have the right answer, then I'm going to be going to hell. And I don't want to show to these kids that I don't have the right answer. So I'm going to make them feel bad. And it's really my insecurity. That's something we have to avoid and pray against. And, and, and I hope that doesn't happen in our classes here uh, at the church. Pride is not supposed to come from being right. You know, Pride is not the way to deal with doubt. So what does Jesus do with the doubt here this morning? Now, this is very interesting. When we have people who doubt, when we struggle with doubt, Jude, we read this in our Bible study if you were here Wednesday, Jude says this, with those who doubt, be merciful to them. Don't mock them. Don't belittle them. Don't doubt their doubts or doubt their faith. They just have questions. So be merciful to them and deal with every single doubt very seriously. And that's exactly what Jesus does today. He comes to the disciples in the midst of their doubt and he brings them a word of promise. Jesus comes to those who are doubting. If you are a person who doubts, you're like the disciples this morning. And Jesus comes to you, and he comes to you with a word of promise, a word of mercy, a word of grace. Notice this. Before we get into the Great Commission, Jesus does this. The disciples doubt. And then the very next verse says, the disciples doubt, and then Jesus came to them. They don't doubt, and then Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. It's me. You, you don't, you're, not, you're not buying this? I'm out of here until you've got it figured out. You figure this out, then I'll come back, and then we can talk. He doesn't do that. You have questions? Well, you're just a bonehead. I'm out of here. He doesn't do that. He comes to them, and he begins to make promises to them. He comes to them with a word of promise. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He doesn't say, question authorities. He says, all authority is mine. Me. I who have died for you, I who have shed my blood for all of your sins, I who have reconciled you to the Father, I who have risen from the dead, I who am coming again to judge the living and the dead, all authority has been given to me. And now I rule you with grace and with mercy and with love. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Tell everyone the good news. Bring them to the waters of baptism so we can baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, forgiving their sins giving them everlasting life, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Don't go out and prove you're right. Tell them what I said. You're not going on your authority. I'm sending you to preach good news, to give gifts, to rescue people. And surely as you go, I am with you always to the very end of the age. I am with you surely, certainly, without a doubt, Jesus says. You doubting disciples, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus comes to the disciples and he just starts making them promises in the midst of their doubt. You doubt God's love for you? You doubt that I'm here? You doubt the resurrection? Well, I am here for you. I am here with you. I forgive you your sins and I promise you everlasting life. Maybe you're here this morning and you doubt God. Maybe you're here this morning, you doubt the gospel. Maybe you're here and you doubt your ability to believe. You know you have to have faith to be saved, but you're doubting whether or not you have faith at all. You doubt whether or not you have the ability to have faith. I've got interesting news for you this morning. You do not have the ability to have faith. 
you do not have the ability to believe. The great confession of us is this. We believe that we cannot believe. And that's why Jesus comes to us in the midst of our doubt and in the midst of our unbelief. We're never going to figure him out just by mustering up our will to finally believe in Jesus. No, Jesus has to come down to us. And he comes to us with words of mercy and promise that create faith in our hearts. Small Catechism says it best. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength come to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But Christ has called me by the Gospel. Excuse me, the Holy Spirit has called me by the Gospel. He has granted me enlightenment with His gifts. And He sustains me in the faith. It's Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit coming to us in the Word that gives us faith to believe. We believe that we cannot believe, but Christ comes and gives us faith. He creates something out of nothing, just as he's always been prone to do. And Christ comes to you in the midst of your doubts, and he says, don't embrace your doubts, but hear this promise. I am your God. You are my people. I have died for you. I have risen for you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will dwell with you, in you, and among you. And as long as you doubt, as long as you struggle, as long as you have questions, I am with you always to remind you of my promises, to give you my gifts, and to sustain you in your faith. Jesus comes to us and says, my promises are stronger than your unbelief. My resurrection is stronger than your doubts. And my forgiveness is bigger than your struggles. So if you struggle, Jesus says, come to me and I will surely, certainly, without a doubt, be with you always to the end of the age. And then he doesn't say, so therefore go and show people how right you are because I said this to you. He says, go and show people what I've done. Go talk to them about me, not boasting in how right you are in your convictions, but tell them the truth. That they're forgiven, that I am their God too. All authority has been given to me and I have authority over their lives. Jesus says, tell them, I am the authority who has been sent by the Father to forgive them. I've washed their sins away in my blood, and I have promised them everlasting life. Take these promises to the world. Don't beat them into submission. Open their eyes to the truth. Give them the gospel. This is the Great Commission. Bring them to the waters of baptism where they're granted assurance that their sins are forgiven and eternal life is theirs. And then teach them what I've said. Teach them about my death, my resurrection, my will. Jesus says this to you and to me. Go and do this. And as we do, Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, because I have died for you and I have risen for you. I've baptized you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are mine. Today, when we stand up to confess the Athanasian Creed, That's what we're saying. This is the true Catholic faith by which we are saved. That Jesus is our Savior. And we are His people. Always to the end of the age. This is most certainly true. And it's without a doubt true for you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the forgiveness You have given us. We confess, Lord, that we do doubt. But we thank You that Your promises are bigger than our struggles. We ask you, Father, to keep us faithful to you. Give us conviction. Give us certainty. And when we doubt, remind us of your word once again. Keep us always ever faithful and guide us into everlasting life. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For more information on Faith Lutheran Church of Moore Park, California, and for more podcast episodes like this one, visit us on the web at www.faithmorepark.com Music by Kevin McLeod.